Okay, it's uh, seven o'clock. We'll uh, open this meeting of the Kenmore Planning Commission. First item of business is public comments. Uh, do we have anybody who cares to share any comments with us here tonight? Rita? Yes, I see one hand raised. Um, Vicki Grayland. Vicki, I'm going to promote you to a panelist and once your mic is unmuted, you can start and you have three minutes. Sorry, I just lost my screen. You have three minutes for your comments. And go ahead. Uh, good evening, commissioners. I was very fascinated by the idea of corner stores. I grew up in a Chicago suburb that had a lot of corner stores. And I wanna tell you uh, some things I did not read in the Seattle Times opinion piece. Um, yeah, I'm very pro corner store. They were usually on the ground floor of apartment buildings and uh, even the pharmacy and the hairstylist would be at the corner store, it, literally on the corner. And um, then we had these two flats that were corner stores that were usually next to a school. And their main thing that they sold was candy. They were usually multi-generational two flats and the families lived in the upstairs, the floor, uh, the second floor, which uh, also solved a problem for low cost housing. Um, so you might want to consider these things. That's all I wanted to say. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Appreciate your, appreciate your comment there. So Rita, is, is uh, anyone else in, in queue to share any comments with us? Uh, yes, I see one more hand, Elizabeth Mooney. Great. <clears throat> Elizabeth, I will unmute your mic and promote you to panelist. And once you begin speaking, you'll have three minutes. Hi there. I can't tell if you see me. We can't see you, but. Is there, I mean, I've noticed that, I don't know why we can't see people giving public comment in planning commission, but, so, and I also don't see how many minutes I have. So it's a little bit disconcerting. And it's a yeah, you have, you have three minutes, uh, Elizabeth, so, so go ahead. Okay, so my name is Elizabeth Mooney. I used to be a part of the Planning Commission, so I remember Mike, hello, and I was on the shoreline portion. Um, one, one comment that I just need to find out from you is whether or not you received my husband, Jim Myers, and my email. It went to the City Council and it went to the Planning Commission. Great. Um, Nathan, I have not met you in person. I've seen when you became a part of the group. Thank you. Um, yes, the Lake Point site, which is by Department of Ecology, is called Kenmore Industrial Park. It is not called Lake Point, and that is because it is a toxic site. I do not understand, and I am really bummed out, that the city is spending so much time giving you all um, a whole July 6th meeting about Lake Point and comprehensive plans. If you were to go to, this, to a lot of us citizens, we would say that we want our shoreline to be restored. We want it to be salmon habitat. And Mike, you'll recall back when we were working on the shoreline master plan with ecology, we talked a lot about the toxins that are there. They're still there. And we do not know the source of those toxins. So I think it's a bit of a cart before a horse I have already talked to Rob Carlinzi. It is, um, there is an existing consent decree. The owner is out of compliance as of 2019, according to the citizen um, discussion that we've had with Bob Warren and also the AG's office, Ivy Anderson. So before the city spends a whole lot of time and resources and volunteer efforts and vision, let's think about how that could be a park where people can enjoy restoration of the wetland that used to be there. Please talk to other people who have been involved that are still in Kenmore, like um, friends like Bonnie Olson. Um, I've discussed this with Tracy Bonazinski. I've discussed this with several of our council members. Um, I'm very concerned that this, this um, purchase and sale agreement has now basically muzzled our council. And that is a big problem from my point of view. It's not an issue about anything other than there's an existing consent decree. 
for the Kenmore Industrial Park. It was signed in 2001. And I don't even know what's in the purchase and sale agreement. Um, I think we need to know because it's a matter of public health and safety. Use the um, waters. We want our salmon to be healthy. And we want to know, like at Gasworks Park, there are toxins there. People give full disclosure. Don't put your feet in the sediment. We still don't know where the PCBs and the dioxins are coming from. And that's a toxic landfill that's covered by a MOTCA site. Um, and I can happy to propose that Bob Carlin's that Mooney and Brian Hampton be on. Ms. Mooney, that is your three minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so, Rita, any other uh, any other comments? Uh, yes, can... I see one more hand up. Sure. Stacey Valenzuela, I will unmute your mic, and you'll have three minutes to talk. Go ahead, Stacy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Stacy Valenzuela, Kenmore. It it concerns a lot of our citizens that in a time when we are calling for climate change and the city calls themselves environmental stewards, that we have to fight so hard to protect our environment, to have cleanup, and to get air emissions tested when people are sick in our community. It's really disheartening that we have to fight this hard. And uh, we should be protecting the land over at Tolochity's Squires Landing. We should not be cementing that. And we call on all of you to fight for this because this is just so wrong uh, to use it for private use and take a park that was uh, just serene and such a natural habitat when all of our surveys that came back in 2019, the first thing our residents wanted were natural habitat and trails. Our residents are environmentally stewards. and They want to keep everything um, and do as much as they can for climate change. The other issue I bring up is uh, tonight about uh, the, the stores on the corner. Um, if the little store, which this is one good thing that Kenmore has done, we have little pockets to where we have little stores and they don't disrupt or stand out like a Circle K would. There is a 7-Eleven, but most people don't even know where it is because it's kind of hidden behind a couple buildings. There is also the little store that's down here on 181st and people do treasure them. However, we do not want to be like Shoreline or any of the other places to where you have the loitering outside and the showing up and the kids hanging out there. We should be doing more stuff to where the kids have something to do and so that they're doing something in a positive note instead of standing outside of a business uh, trying to get people to buy them beer and uh, doing drugs and just hanging out. So um, I think this is not the best idea for Kenmore. I think that it should be held, instead of it being a zoning, it should be held to where if a person comes and asks, hey, I want to put a store on this corner, that there's a public hearing for the residents that will mostly be affected, especially in that area, and see if it's a fit and if it's going to cosmetically fit in and what they're going to do to have it fit in. If there's a little tiny house and they can make it into a nice little coffee shop, I'm sure the neighbors would love it. But if it's, you know, a Circle K looking type building that all of a sudden goes in on their corner and you have all the elements that it's tend to hang out of those places. That's your three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, Rita, any any others uh, on the on the line there for um, all the comments? Um, I do not see any more hands raised. Great. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for your uh, comments there. Uh, the next item of business is approval of the minutes of the uh, July sixth planning commission meeting. Do I hear a, a motion to that effect? I move that they be adopted without, and if there's no objection, that they be a, uh, by unanimous voice vote. Okay, uh, I have a second on that. I'll second. 
Okay, any discussion on the motion? Uh, seeing none. Rita, can we just, uh, can you just maybe call for a voice vote instead of the, the roll call vote then? I guess that's the way we can do that. Uh, yes. So I'm sorry, that's my first time having to do that. Would that just be calling everyone individually? No, I'll tell you what, I'll just go ahead and, and do that and you can just record it. Let me, let me simplify that. I'm, I okay. apologize. So, so I'm all in Thank favor you. of uh, approving the July 6th meeting minutes. Uh, say aye. Aye. Uh, okay. aye. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, uh, the, motion, uh, the motion passes. Okay, the next item is the land use element update, corner stores in residential areas. So welcome, Lori. The, um, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, Debbie, did you want to make any comments or I'll just go for it? <laughs> I, I say you just go for it, Lori. Okay, <laughs> thanks. So good evening, Chair Orrin Shalom, members of the Planning Commission. Um, tonight we're going to begin discussions about corner stores in residential neighborhoods. So this was an issue that was raised by the City Council in early discussions about the Comprehensive Plan Land Use Update. And uh, the question was whether allowing these small corner stores in residential neighborhoods would be appropriate for Kenmore. The benefits of these small shops, which are closer to home, are that residents may have an opportunity to walk or bike to shops or services rather than having to drive to a large commercial area, either downtown or one of our uh, neighborhood centers. Historically, uh, corner stores, which are not always on the corner, um, have provided convenience items for those living nearby. And modern corner stores uh, are larger. They range from 1,500 to 3,000 square feet. And a study in 2019 uh, noted that they average about 24 or 2,500 square feet in size. Um, typically, corner stores offer a limited selection of everyday items like beverages, groceries, and sundries. So there are many advocates of corner stores, uh, particularly those located in historic buildings. And I included a Seattle Times article uh, for you uh, to look at. Um, the store cited in that article was about 800 square feet in size and it had been there a very long time. Uh, supporters include strong town proponents and who they cite benefits such as convenience, walkability, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought someone said something. Uh, convenience, walkability, neighborhood cohesion, and eyes on the street. Uh, there are also detractors who express concerns about aesthetics, trash, noise, parking, and increased crime. Certainly fit into a neighborhood is critically important. Uh, so Kenmore doesn't have old pre-existing commercial buildings in neighborhoods, so it's likely that a modern corner store model would be used if the use was permitted. Of course, uh, as, as Ms. Valenzuela pointed out, it could also be a, a house uh, conversion if that was economically feasible. Um, and that's why I included pictures of modern uh, corner stores, including Circle K's. Uh, and then uh, there were three more recent ones where um, the proponents were trying to, to create a more aesthetically appealing uh, corner store. Those were Foxtrot, uh, Choice Market, and the Goods Mart. That was a little tiny one. The Goods Mart, in fact, uh, that's in LA, and it's the same size as, as the historic corner store in the newspaper article. So as the commission considers corner stores, uh, thinking about design is critical. And if the concept in general is attractive, future zoning regulations, which we would not be taking up this year, could address design issues such as maximum size, height, uh, building and facade treatment. Um, and zoning standards could also require, for example, a public hearing or a, some extra level of community review. So to sort of frame the policy uh, issues, uh, we asked a series of questions in the memorandum. And if you don't have further questions, uh, we can launch into those and, and try to um, come to a consensus if possible or not. 
Lori, do you want to just review also, I, I see you have some things about policies in other jurisdictions. You want to maybe summarize those two before we get to the... Yeah, I, I can do that. Um, so Kirkland has their comprehensive plan policies that talk about an I, uh, corner stores as an idea. They do not have implementing zoning and Bothell and Shoreline also uh, do not have implementing zoning. So to create this zoning, which again would be a future project, not something we're going to be taking up um, at this time, would be we would might be breaking new ground. I, I did a lot of searching for uh, corner store zoning specifically uh, and, and couldn't find a good model. Although you'll remember that um, the city manager had forwarded that article about accessory commercial uses, which is, would be another approach. And we'll talk about that in the policy questions. Okay, thanks, Lori. Mm -hmm. So how would you like to, um, how would you like to, uh, to work on this? You want to um, just go through the questions one by one? Is that what you had in mind? Uh, that's what I had in mind. I think Commissioner Bonajinsky has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Tracy. Yeah. So just a question of um, a definitional question, a question of clarification before we jump into the conversation. And like you just alluded to the fact that we may be getting to this, but I wanted to make sure that I understood um, whether or not corner store and accessory commercial units are distinct concepts here. I'm, I think there might be some overlap, or I, I just wanted to be clear about that before. Yeah, I, I think there definitely could be overlap. I think it gets to how, uh, if, if the concept is desirable, it could be handled in a couple of different ways. And, and we will get to that in one of the questions, but one way would be to identify it as an accessory commercial use. Another way would be to say it's its, it's, its own use. It's not accessory to a residential uh, mm -hmm. unit, for example. So when you were providing staff recommendations, did you have in mind a corner store being separate from, I was thinking of um, accessory commercial units as being something that somebody, more like an ADU, that a private property right. would build on their property adjacent, but I, the corner right. store seems to be like more like it could be a, just a standalone structure, is that? Uh, the staff recommendation, and again, we'll get to that in, in one of these questions, is that either approach would work. Um, there are pros and cons uh, to those approaches, and we can talk about that when we okay, get to You that. are thinking about that. But I just want to be clear in my mind. You are thinking about them as somewhat separate. Both. I'm thinking about them as both. Staff doesn't have a recommendation one way or the other. We think both approach, either approach would work. For the concept. Right. But you're, you're thinking of them as two different approaches. The corner yeah. store approach. Okay. Thank you. That, that helps me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead, Dwight. Okay. Just for clarification, when you use the term commercial, that could mean a lot of different things. So are we talking tonight about the concept? And I maybe it's a broad concept i'll give you that but the concept is retail in a in a neighborhood type of setting and we're not going to talk about opening up businesses that are not retail to service that neighborhood that's not what we're talking about tonight right uh no that that is what we're talking about tonight um and one of the questions asks the very question should it only be something like a retail corner store, which is a retail use, or should there be a limited number of commercial uses, hair salons, coffee shop, bakery, that would also fit in this concept? Uh, one thing I really wanna emphasize as we go through this discussion tonight is that we are not writing the zoning rules. We need to think about this at a very high uh, conceptual level where we would be crafting we could craft a goal and maybe a few policies under that goal that would talk about an interest or desire to uh, pursue this approach, but we would not be specifying exactly what uses, exactly where, um, et cetera. That would be for a much more involved zoning code project that would write the implementing regulations for the use. 
So at this point, the reason I kept saying generally or high level is because we're at the policy level to decide whether we like the concept or not. Okay. Go ahead, Mike. Again, I don't want to launch us into the zoning discussion, which I believe would be a huge undertaking later on. But conceptually, I'm a little concerned about using repeatedly through this uh, the description of uh, a corner grocery store as uh -huh. kind of a show all. And really what we're talking about here are it's more like small retail enterprises within the neighborhoods, which could be a, a whole host of different things. And, and I think part of what Dwight may have been getting at, and I don't, Dwight, correct me, I don't want me to put words in your mouth, but I think conceptually there's a question about are we talking about uh, enterprises, retail enterprises that are primarily there to service the neighborhood they sit in, or could that be wider types of commercial enterprises? I mean, could we have a law office that, that's going to have a practice well beyond the community? Could it be a, an office setting of some sort uh, that's, that's something else? And I'm not advocating a war against it, but I think we need to understand that because those two different things have very different flavor. You're not going to have people walking and biking uh, to a regional uh, office setting. Uh, that's not what, what I think we're talking about here. But I think we need to be clear to go through this that that is, in fact, what we're talking about. What, what are we actually talking about? And I really suggest yeah. we remove the whole small corner grocery store description here because I think it leads to a, a connotation that's very misleading to people who read this because I think we're talking about something much wider. We're not talking about corners. We're not talking about just grocery stores. We're talking about a whole range of potential retail enterprises that people get into. I, I, I would I suggest I would suggest maybe going back and sort of retaking a look at the policy language from um, you know Kirkland or Bossel or Shoreline to see how they sort of framed the discussion for this because I think it's really talking about you know small scale meeting daily needs. So I think it's if you look at that and if you if you look at the how those are written and we think does that really get to the heart of this discussion is one way to sort of just kind of see if that makes sense as a framework and then the other one I think is I think we might be able to arrive at some of the answers to this as we move through some of these policy questions. So I think it's probably an iterative process is to look at how the policies in the other jurisdictions are written so that does that really get us to that? We can go through these policy questions and then see then if we, we've we reached a conclusion. But I think you're trying to find an answer first without, um, if we go through some of these questions, some, some of it may, may become clearer. Just just a thought. Just a follow up, and I don't disagree with you at all, Debbie, and I hope you or Laurie or somebody will go and take a look at that language and bring something back to us. But I do think conceptually, uh, we need to address that as part of our policy. Whether we have it's that. one of the questions. It, it, it is, uh, I can tell you that it's um, question number, which one? Uh, two. Um, so if, if we want to start at a, these, these questions kind of get more and more specific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as we think about it. Um, so the first question is really very broad, which is, should the city consider an opportunity for small shops, services, certainly not regional. I was not even thinking of office, but uh, shops and services that satisfy daily needs. Uh, is that a concept that the commission is interested in? And we we looked at a little bit of background information, which is that um, at least for groceries, these smaller uh, opportunities are along either Buffalo Way or along um, a Juanita Drive. And that most neighborhoods really are farther than walking distance from an opportunity to um, get groceries or services. Um, particularly if a person were carrying groceries. I mean, you can't go more than about a quarter to a half mile comfortably. So 
for that reason, staff thinks that the concept, and, and I'm perfectly comfortable calling it uh, small retail enterprises or enterprises that meet daily needs, which is the way Kirkland phrases it, uh, staff thinks probably the concept is worthwhile. So that's the first question. Is the commission as a whole interested in the concept? And if yes, we'll move on to more specific questions. Do you want us to just weigh in individually? What's the, <laughs> what's the most efficient way to, to do that? Um, we do thumbs that... up and thumbs down. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> Thumbs up like or the... thumbs down. <laughs> OK, why don't we have a thumbs up or thumbs down? Okay. Well, I think we should talk a little bit about this. Yes. OK, well, go, go ahead, Dwight. What's your, what's your thought um, on the sort of conceptual, conceptual question here? Well, it's a broad conceptual question. And it is. The, the, and I think to really answer the conceptual question, there has to be certain under uh, some pillars for that to go forward. Um, I am right with Mike. He interpreted my concerns um, very well. Thank you, Mike. And also I have concerns about um, the whole concept of single family neighborhoods and there's a significant issue, especially with some of the developments that have recently gone in. Um, how is that going to, to really affect our, our entire single family residents? I think the, and the other issue is I'm, I'm concerned about um, the environment you know what what's going to happen with our environmental rules and and our safekeeping of our um, canopy and our wetlands and all this stuff this it's kind of a it's a creep and I'm a little concerned in general I think that in some situations this is a very plausible policy Go ahead, Tracy. So I'm, the background that I'm coming to this discussion with is that I lived from the time I went to college until the time I moved to Kenmore, which was mo mo most of my adult life, um, in neighborhoods where I could walk to corner stores or small retail hubs. Um, of course, you, most people live like this when they're college students because that's how college towns tend to be structured. Um, when I went to graduate school, I was on the East Coast in Connecticut. I lived in a, I don't know what the zoning was, but they were all single family homes. Some of them had been broken into apartments. There were some bigger apartment complexes, but everything was kind of well integrated because it was an older neighborhood um, built out when the zoning probably was much different than it is today. And we, there were corner stores so within, like I could have three opportunities to walk like within a block to either a grocery store, a liquor store that was closed on Sundays and a restaurant. Um, and it was a wonderful way to live. And then even in Seattle, I lived in neighborhoods where we could walk to, I don't know technically what they're zoned as, but either like a standalone corner store or um, some part of a smaller kind of retail hub in, in a neighborhood. Um, and uh, so, the past five years is the only time in my adult life that I haven't had access to those things. Um, my quality of life then I think was much different. I could walk more places. Now we have to get in the car for everything. And for me, that is a climate and environment issue. Like I think we need to be um, developing 15 minute walkable neighborhoods. Um, and I think that fitting corner stores into our neighborhoods, being very sensitive, like staff said to design issues, could be a very environmentally and climate sound way for us to think about growing our, our community. So that's a little bit about where I'm coming from and why I feel supportive of this at a very conceptual level. Like when I'm envisioning what I would like our community to be for the future, for my child, for salmon, for the environment, like I, overall, I feel like I'm a yes on this. Okay. Any others want to weigh in, um, you know, on the conceptual, uh, question before us at this at this point heard from two people specifically um go ahead mike just weigh in with my own experience uh and a discussion i also grew up on the east coast uh in a small town uh, that had 
when I was very young, uh, corner stores about every three blocks, and uh, they were used. Uh, I later lived in New York City, where I had the same experience. And uh, they were very useful for uh, people living in those neighborhoods at the time. What I saw uniformly, though, over a period of time was they all went out of business. They're not there anymore. Why not? And one could yearn back to some other, better, simpler time. Uh, but I worry about what's the practicality of this? Uh, where do these and what type of ventures fit in uh, in today's environment when Amazon uh, can bring something to your door within a matter of hours? Uh, why are people going to the big box stores? And why, uh, why are those stores disappearing? I, I don't put a value judgment on it. I just think about the reality of it. The other piece of it that kind of concerns me a little bit, and, and, and again, this may be the discussion for more when we get into zoning, as we talk about building or allowing or, or, or a desire to have uh, these sorts of retail enterprises within walking distance. And they work in some very large uh, cities. Uh, I still see in, in some neighborhoods uh, there where they work. But the prerequisite there seems to be and the consistent common denominator is very deep density so that you can have those individual enterprises become economically viable. Uh, would, what was the catchment area in a single family neighborhood uh, within Kenmore, within a quarter to a half a mile, what is the retail uh, catchment area for that enterprise? Uh, how much business are they gonna really draw from a quarter to a half a mile? Now, it may be that 20 years from now, we will look like downtown Seattle and we will have that sort of density. We may have that sort of density we see in other large cities. Uh, but if we're talking about this as a policy today, is this, is the, is this the, the vision we have? And is it practical today? Just that, those are the sorts of thoughts that go through my mind. Uh, spice, spike, I mean, those are other ways other than walking you could get there, which increases that catchment area. But I think there's some practical issues here about whether this really works uh, in, in Kenmore. Um, any others want to, want to? I didn't hear who that was. I'm getting some feedback. I'm wondering if maybe if we all muted ourselves, if it would help while we're not speaking. Good idea. Well, I'm sure I, 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 I have some of the, you know, same, I guess, I guess you'd call them concerns that, um, Certainly, that Dwight and, and, and Mike and Tracy have um, have have raised. I do wonder about the kind of the business case and the feasibility, and, and obviously the design and scale and the neighborhood fit are, are obviously essential. But I'm certainly willing to explore it on a conceptual level. I think it will be there will be maybe limited opportunities um, in, in Kenmore, but I think um, again I'm, I'm certainly open to looking at the the opportunities. So that's that's where I stand. Um, Suzanne Dennis. Um, Nathan, any anything you want to share about about um, your? Sure, I can speak my mind a little bit. Um, I agree with Commissioner Van Allen's point about all of the feasibility and stuff, and he makes a very good point there. Um, and I guess we'll just have to see if that really works out. If it does, you know, we'll just have to to really see. And I, I but I, I think providing that opportunity to be there wouldn't hurt. And I don't see there. I guess potentially being a downside if it doesn't work out and it doesn't work out, but if it does, it does. And I think that's good. Um, you know, times are constantly shifting and we might swing back to a time or uh, a point where that might be more necessary, depending on what circumstances bring in the next five, 10, 20 years. So having that opportunity open, I don't think would be a bad thing. Um, but what kind of stuck out to me when reading through this was um, Kirkland's, what Kirkland said, um, or at least the, the comment that city staff made about how it's not allowed in low density residential areas, which I think makes sense. Um, you know, it kind of going through my mind, I don't see why we would allow maybe a corner store in kind of a sparsely populated area where it might not be used. It might seem very out of place. Um, or, and, and also keeping in mind um, in the residential neighborhoods, you know, I don't think we want it 
want their we address this later or the city staff address this later about spacing but um, not having them you know every other house and and so I, I don't think that would make a lot of sense um, and I know I'm kind of getting ahead of the game here Lori but um, one of the things that city staff had recommended was potentially only allowing them on boulevards and neighborhood connections I believe um, and that was something that I wanted to keep in the back of you know my mind as, as we progress through this that that might be an option for balancing this um, with also maintaining the character of our residential neighborhoods which is something that I think we're going to be discussing later on um, but I guess just to kind of summarize everything succinctly um, I don't see a downside to providing the opportunity um, if the if it works out for a local business owner I think that is a great thing and if it provides uh, walkable retail for uh, some neighborhoods especially in some of the areas that are further away so like in the southeast east quadrant or, or maybe the um, on the very upper north side you know who, uh, where I am I live in the southeast quadrant of the city there's there aren't corner stores very close it's quite a ways to walk to get to one eat away or even to downtown Kenmore and I've I've done it I walk all over the city I've walked to the downtown I've walked to St. Edwards I've walked all over um, so I think allowing that opportunity it might bring about some good things um, but you know, I, I think we'll kind of feel this out with some of the more specific questions that we're going to get into tonight. Thank you, Nathan. Suzanne, Dennis, anything you want to share about, about, about this? I support the idea of continuing to investigate this. I share the concerns that have been raised by everyone, but I think that'll come out as we go through the questions. Right, I, I agreed too. And I think um, in item number three, the staff mentioned allowing the economics of the corner store development to identify a specific location within a wider area, meeting community preferences. And I think that's gonna be key here too, is um, I, I don't think if someone wants to have a sustainable business and make money that they're gonna choose a, a location that's not viable. And I think with the, the other questions here, it, they address some of the concerns that were brought up by other commissioners. All right, well, thank you. It's, it sounds like we have, again, Lori, a, a, a conceptual support for exploring it with, with the noted uh, you know, issues and concerns that we'll presumably address. So does that give you what you need for question number one? Oh, Lori, you're. <laughs> I muted myself and then I forget to. So, yes, it did give me the information I needed. And the next question uh, really gets to concerns that Commissioner Vanderland uh, mentioned about well, what kind of uses are we talking about? Um, I like the idea of not using the term corner store. Uh, I do think that if we were to think about small retail enterprises or um, the businesses serving daily needs, that could be a way to describe uh, what is being considered. I do think that the, those other kinds of uses we talked about, again, staff was not recommending office, uh, but we were talking about uh, service retail uses, coffee shops, um, bakeries, uh, grocery stores, that kind of thing. And then perhaps uh, service uses. And in the zoning code, service uses are things like hair salons and, and, um, and those certainly could be defined in terms of size and scope. But uh, I'm interested in your perspective. And of, of course, as we try to refine what a, a goal and a policy might look like, this is an important are you envisioning um you know mike mentioned i think uh, you know a law firm or something like that are you envisioning that the sort of i don't know professional services i don't know if that's the right word is that the kind of thing you're not thinking that this would 
this would I, encompass? I was or? not anticipating professional services or office. Um, or office of any kind, okay. Right. Um, I was thinking of, again, those kinds of businesses that um, would, would serve uh, a person who lived in the neighborhood not bringing in a lot of other individuals. And, and actually services like a hair salon may bring in too many people, um, but a uh, uh, barbershop, um, I'm trying to think of, um, small pharmacy is probably a retail use. Most things I'm thinking of are retail uses. Um, but the question is whether there are small service uses that should be or could be considered and, and how that would, uh, make its way into policy would be, you know, should we allow businesses uh, such as small retail enterprises or, or businesses that serve the daily needs of local residents uh, to locate in an area? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> if we could have that language in whatever the final recommendation is, uh, that would help address that issue for me. We don't have something like that specifically in here right now. And it, if a couple of people on the commission could question that going forward, I, I think it could be general. And, and you know, if you take a tour through some of the neighborhoods, particularly single family neighborhoods in Kirkland and elsewhere, and you see where there have been conversion from a, a single family residence to an office, you see quite a few of professional services there that are obviously go beyond the neighborhood. And again, I mean, I wouldn't, I'd be interested to have a, if people want to have a discussion of whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think we need to be clear about it. Particularly if what we're doing, if we have a specific em emphasis on reducing vehicular traffic and having walkable uh, neighborhoods, uh, then I think that speaks to what sort of, uh, what's the character of the businesses uh, that we would see allowable. Go ahead, Nathan. Um, I agree with that concern. Um, I know of some uh, converted houses into businesses in the local community. Um, Bothell, for instance, that I've traveled to, to go to, and I don't walk, I didn't walk there. Um, so I think it has the opportunity if we allow that to really bring in um, people from outside of the neighborhood. And I think that's expanding beyond the scope of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, although I would say like a small neighborhood coffee shop, I could see being very appealing. I, I think that could be a, a daily need for some people, especially those who love coffee. Um, but I, I want to be careful that it doesn't become, you know, even a small Starbucks that increases the volume of traffic coming in to the area of, and most likely beyond just the neighborhood. Um, so I guess I'm hoping we might be able to find a way to emphasize the neighborhood and local community aspect as opposed to um, a, a business or service that expands beyond the daily needs or is likely to um, bring in uh, flow from outside of just the neighborhood. And actually, we've already allowed for that sort of development in our zoning and other other parts of the city, for instance, downtown and in the neighborhood business. So I think we need to be careful that we don't uh, dilute the intent there uh, by having competing businesses in an inappropriate place within a single family neighborhood outside of those uh, zones where we're trying to create that kind of density and concentration. Yeah, go ahead, Dwight. So one of my thoughts in, in Figuring, working in my mind, trying to figure out what is the best policy is a practical approach to, I, I know that there are studies in the uh, business sector uh, through AWC and other um, types of organizations, chambers, that um, show exactly what the scale of of a customer base a particular type of service needs in order to survive at a certain size. So whether it be a coffee shop, 
a grocery, a little corner grocery store, uh, like a pharmacy, for instance. I I would think that the cost of doing business and to do, sorry about the dog, um, the uh, you know the cost of the drugs and and affiliation. Uh, it's like the difference between Safeway and an IGA. I think that's, I used that correctly. Uh, the different types of, of uh, affiliations that, that are available. And so looking at what really can go into and be a viable business, I think there's some already studies that we could use to look at what are opportunities. And again, I like uh, Nathan's perspective is that it's, it's also an issue of density and walking. Really what our goal here, I thought, was that we're trying to do, you know, communities where you're actually going to walk to these places. And finally, um, there's been several well-stated comments about drawing people in from outside and that has to do with not only cars and all the pollution and everything but the parking issues and we if we were to go into that realm we would start creating a situation where we have a lot of unhappy neighbors uh, in in the community so I, that's why I was looking at the this not the scientific but the commercial development of how um, the the um, the numbers work as far as what's a viable business. Thank you. I think Dwight, just real quick, I think Dwight brings up a really good uh, point about um, you know parking. I mean, it certainly is is um, not everyone's able to walk or bike to a service. You know, even if it's a quarter mile or a halfway away, and and so there's certainly going to be some some need for some level of parking with pretty much any commercial enterprise. So. I don't know what the sweet spot is for the number, but I think it is something we're going to have to really, um, you know, at some point um, kind of uh, address that. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, I think Tracy and then Nathan. <laughs> yeah, so just on a, um, I'm going to answer this question from a, a, a visualization overall conceptual point of view, because that's where we are. And on this question number two, I'm also a yes. So I, I would be in favor of um, corner stores, not just being grocery, but other kinds of small retail outfits that would serve the needs of the neighborhood and allow people to walk um, from their homes so that we don't have to get into our car for all of our services. I was very happy to move to Kenmore, but very sad that we had to move into a neighborhood where our walkability score was so low. Like that was actually something that we were looking at when we were looking at houses. Um, and unfortunately, we just could not afford to live in a neighborhood where we had where the walkability score was really high. Um, I, I would love um, if that could shift over time, if we could live in a more walkable neighborhood. I think that would be um, wonderful. Um, I just wanted to state, I don't know that it go necessarily goes in, into the high, kind of higher level conceptual conversation, but I did want to say that I would favor um, small local businesses to fill these retail spaces over um, certainly national chains and probably even um, local chains above a certain size perhaps. So, and for me, that would be keeping, that would be partly a design issue and keeping in what, what I see as kind of the character of our neighborhoods. I'm not, I, I still feel like when we talk about our single family neighborhoods and protecting their character, I, 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 I always wanna dig into that a little bit more to understand what that really means uh, because I think it can mean a lot of things to uh, different people. Um, but for me, I would, I, for me, this is about creating people oriented spaces. Um, I love the idea of creating third places in our neighborhoods. So to me, um, that would be something kind of at a higher level that I would love to see happen through a policy like this. And again, favoring small local businesses, which I think would help maintain the character of our neighborhoods and would also keep, um, keep our financial resources circulating in our local economy.
any other thoughts on, I guess, the second question here? Um, you know, Tracy does bring up, I think, a really good point about, um, I, I don't think any of us necessarily envision a Circle K or a 7-Eleven being the kind of the ideal, you know, uh, opportunity that we're talking about. But, you know, I just wonder from the business case standpoint, I mean, would they have more uh, opportunities to make a go of it from a, you know, uh, just a, uh, an economic standpoint? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but it might, it might be a little bit of a conundrum in how we, how we approach that. Um, and certainly, yeah, the design standards are a big part of that. But, um, um, yeah, it would be great if, you know, we could make sure that it was all locally, you know, locally supported and, and, and owned and benefited. I just don't know if the economics will, you know, would, would enable that. So just raising, raising the issue there. Go ahead, Nathan. Uh, there were two points that came to me listening to all of you. Um, and one of those is actually addressed to you, Lori and Debbie. Is there potentially a way to assess uh, regions within the city and find the most ideal kind of zones to allow for these and encourage um, these walkable businesses or something like that? Um, I know that the city staff in the memo discussed the roads, the boulevards and, and neighborhood connections, but putting a a corner store or a local retail store um, a few streets up from one eight away won't serve much of a purpose if the person if the same um, resident can still walk to one eight away versus somebody who's even a few streets further away so is there potentially the opportunity to, opportunity to assess maybe regions within the city that it might be most appropriate to allow for these um, you, yeah, um, I, okay. I think so. I, I think that that, it, again, is not something we would be doing through this process, except perhaps very generally. Uh, so, for example, uh, we might set out some um, kind of policy level criteria. You know, we want this to be, if we decide on a road type, we want to, this to be near this road type, or we want this to be limited to um, nodes where we would consider accessory com commercial uses or something like that. And in terms of setting out a specific zoning district, staff is not recommending that. Um, oh, we're saying oh, well. that, the, that the decision be more fluid uh, mm -hmm. because, just because of the economic feasibility question. I, I didn't mean like a zone. I, I guess uh, I should rephrase this. When we looked at parks a while back and we looked at the walkability of parks, you had a map mm -hmm. with the bubbles around the parks about how far those reached. And I was wondering if it would be possible to do something similar with corner stores or current um, neighborhood retail stores to find those spots within the city that isn't being reached by a walkable small retail store and maybe emphasize those locations for the development of uh, any of these stores in the future. Does that make more sense? Uh, that makes total sense. And you've just described the kind of a policy that would be put in place. Okay. We would not draw the circles. <laughs> that would be something that would happen at the level of the zoning. But to okay. set out something that says, you know, here are the criteria, locational criteria, or here are the mm -hmm. kinds of locations that we think this is worthwhile. Okay. And that should be considered definitely. Okay. Is, is appropriate. And then my last point, um, uh, I guess to more appropriately address point number two about um, small scale service or non-grocery retail to also be considered. Going back to Mike's point about um, small houses that have been converted into law firms or something like that. I, I don't feel that neighbors are walking to law firms on a, on a daily basis. I, I feel that the people who attend those are driving in from further out. So I'd be very hesitant expanding it to wider retail um, beyond just maybe daily need for local residents um, because it would most likely increase the amount of travel and go beyond just serving that neighborhood or, or community. Um, so that's my hesitation on that one beyond just um, local and daily needs. So 
Well, I guess I was just going to point out that question number three and five both kind of address Nathan's um, questions or concerns or discussion points about location of, of the these retail opportunities. So I don't know. It's, it kind of feels like we're skipping around the questions a bit. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so yeah, shall I, I agree, move I forward agree with you. I, I think we are skipping around. And in fact, my logic train going through these would have put these questions in a little different order. Uh, when I look at this, <laughs> our answer to number three, particularly the a general opportunity to be given to understand the approval criteria would be developed and the community involvement would be required. To me, answer to that provides the condition under which I would feel comfortable or uncomfortable with all the rest of the, uh, of the proposals here. Uh, if we knew that was true, then a lot of these decisions for me become a lot easier. Go ahead, Dwight. Well stated, Mike. Uh, the way number two, without some of the other questions being answered, I, I could not support number two because I don't really believe number two by itself is supported by the majority of the residents and citizens of Kenmore. And I think if someone who do not have the opportunity to listen to our debate about this would read that and if we said this is where we're going they would say are you kidding so i'm with mike that if we could put some of the three and other items a little more before we get to two and then reference that based upon the other conditions which we have discussed, then I would feel more comfortable with number two. Should we then move on to oh, number shall three? Shall we jump to number three? <laughs> right. Sounds like that's a good, good, idea. Uh, good, good next step, uh, Lori, yeah. Okay, um, so the question is, should specific corner store locations be identified or should a general opportunity be given? with the understanding that approval criteria would be developed and that community involvement would be required. So staff really identified three ways that this uh, small retail enterprise could be considered. One would be to actually uh, expand uh, and create additional nodes of neighborhood business zoning. So then you'd specify location and you would create a new zoning district that would allow other types of uses. And it, you know, it could be four parcels right at the corner, something like that. But uh, in fact, one of our neighborhood business zones, believe it or not, is one parcel up in the uh, north uh, west portion of the city. Uh, the other neighborhood business zone is at Northeast 153rd and Juanita Drive, right near Arrowhead Elementary. That's a neighborhood business zone. So that would be one approach. The second approach would be to identify sort of general locations where uh, accessory commercial units could be permitted. So an accessory commercial unit is like an accessory dwelling unit. It would have to be attached to a primary residence, but it would allow someone, for example, to convert a garage or um, convert a portion of their house into a commercial use. And you could identify general locations where someone could apply to do an accessory commercial use. The third approach is to say, it doesn't have to be an accessory commercial use attached to a residence. It could be a standalone um, small retail enterprise. And again, you could specify certain general areas, but there would be locational criteria so that you wouldn't, uh, your areas would be sort of vague. <laughs> and, and the idea would be that someone who wanted to propose this could come to the city and say, here's what I want to do. Here's the use I'm interested in. Here's what it would look like. 
and then there would be a community involvement, a public hearing of some sort. To, and that would allow a person to um, choose a location based on what they think is economic feasibility, but also to respond to community interests um, that may or may not think it's a good idea. So staff recommends either the second or the third approach. So either the accessory commercial unit, if you want to ensure that there's a residential use on the site, or a, the opportunity for a standalone commercial service business that could be reviewed um, with some general criteria as part of a public process. Go ahead, Nathan. I, I really like two and three as well. I think that would help us keep the, a lot of these businesses local. Um, but I guess what stuck out to me stronger about number two is you won't have a Starbucks moving in if somebody has to live there as well. The owner has to live there as well. Um, and I think that would be great for keeping the businesses within the neighborhood um, and kind of uh, by the neighborhood for the neighborhood or by a, a resident for the residents around them, which I think would be a great thing and a very great thing. Um, especially for communities and, and providing these services. But I also um, am hesitant to, to restrict it that much and to limit it that much. Um, and so that's why I'm still bouncing back between two and three, but that was my initial take on number two and why it first appealed to me. Nathan, I just had to chuckle at the thought of like, an, like an Amazon outpost and then Jeff Bezos having to move in. So thank you for that levity. <laughs> I hesitate to step on that, David. I think that was a great analogy. Uh, I'm personally in favor or attracted more to option number uh, three. Um, and two, I think stated maybe a little differently would be okay. To me, first of all, you know, providing a broader opportunity uh, with local specifics and a strict approvals criteria, to me, that's the heart of this. Uh, I don't think it needs to be specific to ancillary commercial units, and I would, wouldn't do that. I think that opens up a whole nother can of worms. Uh, but I think this allows the potential business developer uh, the flexibility to be able to to determine whether or not they have a, where the location would give them a, the best economic uh, viability. Uh, and I think having that be generally available, as long as you have that strong community approval process and you have uh, some zoning in place and some criteria that define what is really allowable, which includes design and spacing and things that you talk about, Lori, later down, uh, a little further down. I think this is a question um, here, my wanting clarity on what constitutes an I, in terms of zoning a, a corner store from an accessory commercial unit came into play. Because I'm thinking of them differently, but I don't know if staff was thinking of them the way that I am when you were writing these okay. recommendations. So uh, I'll tell you what I think. Um, if I'm thinking of an accessory commercial unit, what I'm thinking of is a business on a property where someone lives. So in all likelihood, I would assume that someone who was applying to do an accessory uh, commercial business would choose to be the person living on the property, uh, but it could be in the house, it could be in a garage, it could be in a detached uh, garage um, so that it's a small business that could, should, I don't know, it would be back to the accessory dwelling unit question, occupied by uh, the owner of the business um, versus a corner store, as uh, we started calling it and now have morphed away from, um, where it is a standalone business. It doesn't necessarily have 
uh, residential uses, although that would be a discussion about whether it should be required that a residential use be included, but it would be on its own parcel, a standalone commercial use. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Laurie. And that is actually exactly how I was thinking about the two concepts as well as being distinct from each other. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm going to gather my thoughts. And if anyone else wants to come at first, I will. I just, I'll jump in here. Uh, Laurie, I just want to make sure that I understand this correctly, too. When we talk about an ancillary commercial unit, there is an overlap with the idea of you have an existing single family home and you convert that to a small retail business. So you're not changing the square foot footage or necessarily in a big way, the impact on the neighborhood. But if you're talking about a, an accessory commercial unit, this could be a separate unit of some size that actually increases the impact of square footage uh, uh, on that property and the usage, which would uh, just like a, uh, the ACE, uh, the other ancillary unit discussions we have could have a disproportionate impact on particularly the neighbors around there. And you get into a whole different discussion. So I think if you use the all encompassing definition of an accessory commercial unit, which would include adding square footage beyond what is in a, in a normal single family uh, operation, you're getting into a whole different discussion. Yeah, I should just clarify. As with accessory dwelling units, the notion of an accessory unit is that it is smaller in scale and subordinate to the principal residence. So I wouldn't want us, if we're thinking of accessory commercial units, to think of a single family house and then in the backyard there's a large commercial structure that is a business. That's not it. It could be, it could be a unit, a basement unit in the house it could be a small accessory structure like a garage. It could be a conversion of a dual, a double car garage, for example. But it would not be that big commercial uh, operation on the same lot as a single family house because it would then not be accessory. It, it would be another principal use. Yes, but it could be a separate unit that adds mm -hmm. square footage Yes. on that lot. Yes, so you, absolutely. If you took out that option, there, what is the real difference between what we were talking about earlier? Uh, what you, you could do a, you, you could take a single family home under I think what we're talking about, at least in concept, and have a business within that existing structure, which family could live in or not, or rent or whatnot, uh, that when you get into talking about accessory commercial uh, units, I, I think you, what's new and different about that is the ability to have a separate uh, new development on that, on that lot. Maybe smaller, that would be smaller potentially, but still significant, particularly when I think back to the conversation we had about accessory dwelling units and just how large some of those got, including multiple stories. And we got into all sorts of discussions about parking and whatnot. Uh, that, that bothers me. I, uh, sorry, I'll just add one more thought on that. The reason I think we finally came back and we're in agreement on the accessory dwelling units is because we believe that that was going to impact favorably uh, the availability of afford affordable housing. And I think that made me feel more comfortable about our final decision. But when we're talking about commercial accessory development, we're talking about a for-profit business. And I'm not exactly sure how, unless we wrote some very strict uh, requirements, which may not be enforceable, uh, that we would be sure that this really had anything in advantage to the to the neighboring community and could potentially have uh, impact on it, particularly the surrounding neighborhoods who now can live with whatever's happening in that new uh, development on that property. Yeah, I, I think the advantage would be the, the typical advantage of um, the notion of corner stores in neighborhoods. So the advantage is not affordable housing. The advantage is providing an opportunity to walk a bike to a shop in a neighborhood. So 
my my response to this question three is that I feel most strongly in favor of option three um, because I, I am feeling like the accessory commercial unit discussion is, it could be a separate one that I, I actually think has merit, but I feel like the core, the idea of providing these small retail, um, be they grocery or bakeries or coffee shops for our neighborhoods for people to be able to have a place to walk to or bike to and gather. Um, I, I feel like being, being able to have some flexibility in where they go um, would benefit our communities um, and not having them to be smaller um, and subordinate to uh, the, the, the footprint of the house that's already on a lot, I think makes more sense to me in terms of growing 15 minute communities and providing, you know, those kind of third places for our communities. Um, yes, I think that's my, my reasoning. I have a couple questions. So is it possible now just everyone uses the term concept. So conceptually, you we could do three and and rephrase the wording in three to um, suggest that it also includes the possibility of two accessory commercial units, because there would still be locational specifics and strict approval criteria. So we've, I thought we've had a very good conversation with regard to the concerns that we all have about what a commercial accessory might or might not look like and what really in some cases may be a separate uh, building um, may be appropriate and uh, I, I'm, I'm open to that uh, and then there's size issues and everything else and I and can we not require some sort of a, um, uh, maybe this is, will probably get, be it thrown out, but some sort of a, a, a way for this business owner to show w what they're going to do for that neighborhood and where they're going to get their business. And finally, is, is this would take care of my concern and it also has been raised by several others, is we don't want a business that's going to draw in people from outside of the concept of a neighborhood business, like a law practice or counseling practice that requires traffic and parking spaces. I think we're sort of all in agreement there. Even hair salons, um, you know, I, I, again, I'm looking at, we, I'd like to see some statistics and some studies that I know have been done about what the the number of households in an area need to there needs to be in order to support certain types of of act, commercial activities. So I'm I'm I would support um, sum up. I would support number three to include a combination of um, the opportunity for com, um, accessory commercial units with the language of of strict controls and blah, 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 all that stuff. So that's where I'm at. So if I could rephrase that a little bit, I think, um, I think what, uh, what I'm sort of hearing is that the idea of allowing commercial through option three with strict locational criteria, strict approval criteria, and the opportunity for a public hearing is so far, at least from those I've heard from, uh, preferred, but uh, Commissioner Thompson's point is that you also could allow someone to live on the property and still make that proposal. So that uh, the idea would be 
those same criteria, et cetera, would apply. But if somebody were proposing to do it and they didn't want to turn over their whole house into a commercial enterprise, but instead they wanted to propose something that left their house on the property where they were going to live and something separate, not necessarily, it would be accessory, but maybe not the same in the same way that that would be acceptable. Did, did I understand that correctly? Did I explain that correctly? Yes, I, I think, I believe so, as long as the accessory piece has strict rules and- um, And criteria and that's, public hearing. As long as that's there, then I'm, I'm okay with being open to both types of, of opportunities in our neighborhood. Go ahead, Tracy. I feel um, supportive of the idea that these small retail, can I just call the corner store for the moment with, with that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my brain's spending far too much time to, trying to string together the words that aren't <laughs> I feel supportive of the idea of these corner store structures being mixed use, which means, you know, the retail space in one part of it and, a, you know, a residential space, be that a rental or the proprietor of the retail space living in it could be above, could be side by side, um, could be behind, you know, the, the, the whatever configuration, I, I, I don't, really have a problem with that, with this corner store concept. Um, in fact, I think that might be, I don't want to say preferable, but I, it, I think it would be a positive thing if we had corner stores uh, with that. Like the, the one restaurant that I lived near when I was in graduate school was, uh, it was a restaurant on the bottom floor. And then there were actually, I think like two or three apartments above. Um, the other corner stores were just single use, like grocery stores and the liquor store, of course. Um, I do, the way that I'm thinking about these accessory commercial units is a little bit different. I am thinking about them as really smaller than the dwelling space and created by the owner of the living space. And so for me, the idea of, I'm not ready to think about restricting those to a certain neighborhoods because for me, then there's equity issues that I wanna tease out and talk about and, and work through. Um, so at this point, I feel like I would like to stick with the corner store concept under condition three, and then think about the accessory commercial units, maybe even separately, if we have the ability to have that conversation separately. Any others have, a, have an opinion on that specific question about, you know, how and whether to include the accessory commercial um, units? I, I could live with what Tracy just said, as long as there's, you know, the, what I was always concerned about was the strict approval criteria and maybe not necessarily locational specifics, meaning there it's doable and it's, you know, it works for the neighborhood. That's maybe what I, I could live with all of that and uh, whatever is the best thing, but it's got to have some strict approval criteria with neighborhood uh, hearings and, and I don't, you know, how that all works out is, as uh, the uh, experts there would say is in the details. Uh, this is, this is sounding better to me. Uh, I don't really see uh, or have a, thought that we need to exclude or differentiate between a wholesale conversion or development of a retail uh, site today, uh, either whole or partial. So if we include a, a, uh, an accessory commercial would be okay. But again, the criteria for the, the kicker for me or, or the turning point is what are the approval criteria uh, that those need to be developed, they need to be well understood, they need to take into account the local uh, the area where, where that, that's going to go into, and it needs to have community involvement. 
if those things are there, then I don't have it. I have much less concern about whether it's a wholesale conversion or it's a uh, an ancillary. Yeah, I like the point about the neighborhood um, kind of approval and buy-in. Uh, Lori, you mentioned public hearings. Are you are you are we envisioning other? I don't know, opportunities for neighbors to, you know, weigh in or, or in some way express their preferences. Did you have a thought about that? I mean, obviously, if there's an approval process, that's, that has its own, I'm sure, you know, rules and regulations and so forth, but. Yeah, I, I definitely was envisioning um, community involvement in the discussion, since it would be right. in the neighborhood. Uh, but again, at this point, we wouldn't be specifying exactly what that exactly process what that looks was, like, yeah. but yeah. we would acknowledge that community involvement was important. Right, okay, yeah. I think by having that community approval and, and the um, community meeting and, and other criteria, I think that will take care of some of the other questions as well. For instance, whether or not it, um, mixed use development or the parking. I think that those things will come up as part of the approval process. Yep. Yep. Well, it sounds like we have, uh, you feel like you have enough on that, on that question, Lori? I do. Okay. Um, and and rather than jump uh, on to the next one about separation requirements, I'd like to go uh, to question five um, about sort of generally, this would be part of the locational criteria and whether um, uh, at this point, uh, corner stores, I'll call them that as well, should be restricted to busier streets or some, you know, a block off a busier street, something like that, or uh, would they be appropriate on local streets? If they're on local streets, it certainly furthers the idea of uh, being able to walk or bike to uh, the corner store. On the other hand, that could be um, a significant change to existing neighborhoods. And so staff recommended that as an initial concept, something new, trying something new, that uh, the locations be um, restricted to areas at or near uh, boulevards like 61st, 80th, uh, Simons Road, um, or neighborhood uh, connections like 73rd, uh, Northeast 155th, that kind of thing. So that not the opportunity not be provided everywhere, but that the locational criteria identifies some proximity to either a boulevard or a neighborhood connection, a busier street. I personally like that idea. And I, I had a sort of a related thought and that is um, the, you know, if we're talking about walkability and I think um, it would, it would be really nice if we made sure that there were sidewalks that could link people to those, uh, you know, to those, locations and I know that uh, you know what are you calling them uh, boulevards neighbor connection I know many of them already have sidewalks and others are in progress but um, to me that's that's kind of a, a key safety function among other things so I don't know if there's a way to uh, you know specify that you know locations have sidewalk access or uh, you know perhaps bike lane access as well um, and again I think there's probably already a, a lot of existing overlap but that was a thought that I had. I mean, we don't want, you know, I know in some of our neighborhoods where we don't have sidewalks, it's, you know, you don't necessarily want people to be walking uh, uh, a lot when there aren't those, those safety uh, uh, measures in, in place. So. so. Go ahead, Tracy. I see um, the merit in restricting the corner stores to what have been labeled boulevards or neighborhood connections because I do agree that adding these corner stores into our neighborhoods might be um, something that might take some people to get, it might take them a while to, to become accustomed 
to them or it might take people a while to come around to them if they ever do maybe some people won't ever um, so kind of putting them where there's more traffic already could make people feel more comfortable with it um, I do I have mixed feelings about that however because I feel like actually in my neighborhood I live on I think you called it a local street is that was that right I live on a local street that actually does not have any sidewalks on either side, um, but it's very, it's just like a block off 61st, which does have sidewalks um, on both sides in some stretches, not on all stretches. Some, on some stretches, it's just on one side. And I actually feel safer walking on my local street than I do on 61st because the cars on 61st drive generally faster than they're supposed to. Um, and it's very hard to cross the street. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult. Like sometimes I'm standing on the intersect, like the corner, and we have to wait for these cars to go, like nobody will stop. <laughs> we just have to wait. Sometimes I have to run across with my nine-year-old. Um, so just overall, I feel safer walking on our local street because there isn't as much traffic. Cars drive slower. Like cars always seem to see us and they go way, you know, they move way to the other side. So it might be more comfortable for some people to walk to a corner store that is not on a busy street. I don't know. Again, this is something I have mixed feelings about. Um, also, I wish in general with development that perhaps we could adopt some locating criteria that also took into account um, not only the built environment that we already have, but, but the natural environment that exists with our built environment. And this is where my environment and, my, and some of my environmental concerns come in. Like maybe there are some stretches along 61st where, you know, they're very close to um, Chachatl, the, the little creek that runs down 61st that we might want to stay away from, like not, not put such a kind of heavy, heavy use on it or near it. It is on 61st, but being sensitive to what that creek needs and that stream needs optimally in terms of amount of space, like maybe we wouldn't want to put it on some places on 61st. So I, that's my wish as an environmentalist that we had more fine grained criteria for where to build new things, I guess, that don't rely just on like what the street is. Um, and it goes a little bit beyond for me, just like the critical areas label, because I, I, I do need, I do think as an environmentalist that we need our environment does need stronger protections than sometimes even those critical areas allow for and their buffers allow for. Um, and especially with the idea of thinking about how we can add net ecological gain um, to the landscape. Like, I feel like we have to think about not just no net loss of ecological function so we can just keep building as long as we're not losing like we can mitigate somewhere else. I feel like we have to think about adding ecological function back. So for me, that might mean sometimes that we, we shouldn't locate a certain development, maybe even cl close to a critical area because it, that critical area might actually need even more space to provide the ecological services for us that we need as humans and that we need for our environment and our climate to be healthy. So I think that's just a very long way of saying that I wish we had more kind of a different granular way of making these decisions about where to develop that took into account our environment and what it needs to be healthy for us. Ben, uh, Lori, I do appreciate your creativity and, and this thought. It, it really resonated me, with me. Uh, when I think about this, and I'm, I'm in favor of uh, your approach here, what came to my mind was Kenmore has still got a lot of infrastructure in build. It's got to do, and it would have to uh, be able to afford uh, if we were going to make, particularly walking and biking within a lot of our neighborhoods today. You don't have really uh, well-developed streets or sidewalks to be able to make that happen. If we were to take a first step toward this uh, by restricting it to uh, certain streets uh, which already have that infrastructure in place, or it would be, I think, more economic, more feasible uh, to do that over a fairly limited period of time, uh, I think that has some value. And when I look particularly at the boulevards, 
uh, these quite naturally are going to develop and that want to develop in that way anyway. So I think it would be almost going with the natural economic flow to do that. The only uh, hesitation I had was I was wondering, I, boulevards, absolutely, I think that's a, that's a great place to do it. I'm a little concerned about neighborhood connections. Some of those look okay, but many of them I'm not sure that that's really, uh, really going to work for what we want here. Uh, boulevards and urban intersections, particularly where those intersections occur, I think those are natural economic points where you could have this sort of development uh, that would benefit uh, the geographic area that they're in uh, in a way that I think you wouldn't get a lot of the resistance or a lot of concern about how do these sorts of developments fit within the, uh, within the neighborhood. So yeah, I like that. I think this, there's a lot to be considered here. Hey, Nathan. <laughs> Commissioner Randallin, you took the words kind of right out of my mouth. I was just about right. to say the exact same thing. Um, the boulevards, I, I feel, are completely fine, and I, and I think those are the most appropriate places to um, open up these, what are we calling them, corner stores, whatever they are this evening. I'm not, still not quite sure. Um, for the reasons that you know, Mike already stated, um, because when you look at neighborhood connections, some of those neighborhood connections, I'm only speaking about some of the ones close to where I live in the southeast quarter, particularly uh, 84th, there, there aren't sidewalks on either side of the road, um, at least on large stretches of it too. Um, and, I, and I don't feel that those kinds of roads, they, they feel more like local roads in a lot of places. And I don't feel like it would be appropriate to open it up, at least not at this time. I'm not saying that I'm opposed in the future once things build up and kind of like Mike was saying, the infrastructure builds up to support that and, and make attending these uh, stores more feasible, safer, economic, um, and all that fun stuff. But at least right now, I feel better uh, just sticking to the boulevards as of right now. But I'm still open to discussion, so we'll, we'll see what some of the others say. Go ahead, Tracy. Um, I hope I'm not being too redundant, but I, I, I think I am advocating again with this thought for a more um, granular approach. Like I'm looking at this map here and I'm looking at um, one Northeast 192nd Street, which is, um, I, live in, I live in the Northwest quadrant of Kenmore, but I often do visit, I visit all quadrants of Kenmore, but I often am in the Northeast quadrant of Kenmore as well. So I'm looking at Northeast 192nd Street and just from being there, I can think of some stretches on that road where I think a corner store would fit, but I can also think of some stretches of, on that road, and it's not a very long one, where corner stores would not fit. Um, and then I, I feel the same way about a boulevard, which is the one I live on, 61st. I feel like I can imagine some stretches on that road, that boulevard, where they would be, I think that they would fit, and I can think of some stretches where they wouldn't. So I, I feel uncomfortable going with a strict boulevard, neighborhood connection, local road decision. I, I, I would feel more comfortable, again, with a, a different, maybe a different, yeah more specific approach, taking into consideration the characteristics of each stretch that we're considering. Right. I totally agree with you. And I think um, the question was asked because the, uh, as part of a uh, policy, we might want to say about the kinds of places, you know, uh, um, a road that carries perhaps more traffic, but that has adequate sidewalks. I mean, there are a number of ways that in policy you could write in and respect the granularity of the decision. And then at the point that the zoning happens, there would probably be more specific boundaries identified, or maybe not, maybe the boundaries wouldn't be identified and all it would be would be the criteria that would help uh, someone know where they might be able to do it. And then the community involvement would surface the kinds of issues that uh, would be of concern to the neighborhood. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And also, just as a, an additional thought as I'm looking at this map, if we stuck only to boulevards, I, I don't know how far we would go in, 
creating 15, many 15 minute neighborhoods because they're pretty spread out. You could also require the, the person to uh, install sidewalks or other kinds of infrastructure if they wanted to put their um, corner store in an area that didn't have that. So I think there are ways you can do, you, you can kind of refine the location through those kinds of requirements and then also the, uh, the neighborhood meeting where they're determining you know, whether it's appropriate there or not. I think that the uh, technical criteria approach that Lori suggested um, is a good approach. Uh, I agree with Tracy that um, just the boulevards is not going to be enough. And that if you look where our density of roads are, there's much more density along the neighborhood connections in, in many cases than there are in the boulevards. And also, I think the boulevards in some cases already have some neighborhood businesses in them, especially uh, going up Juanita Drive. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with the, the concerns like 61st. I mean, that um, just considered people wanting to. Uh, get across the street with kids. Uh, I mean, we're not talking about just Tracy's kids. I'm talking about everybody's kids. And, and, and it's that kind of, and I could see the same deal with uh, Simmons Road and 170th could be very similar to that. Um, but uh, I like the concept that Lori, that you suggested as the technical, you know, work up the, the uh, draft of, of what down the road, of course, and not for this, but the a draft of what the uh, criteria is going to be and that there is um, going to uh, be um, public input and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's wonderful stuff. Now, Suzanne, you do bring up a good point that some of these places people are going to want to put something um, may not have the infrastructure, but uh, I and I I feel the pressure there, but if we start requiring people to put in sidewalks, they will not be able to afford this. Because uh, what we don't want is a 7-Eleven, a commercial, you know, people that can really afford to do that. What we're I thought what our concept was um, is is a, someone local deciding to try to do a local business. But, and I don't want to make light of your comment, Suzanne, about the need for those sidewalks. But I just don't know if what we, maybe what happens if we get a local business in there, then that we could say that that could create a, a priority for our city of where we invest as a city in sidewalks. Maybe that's another way to do it. Um, but I don't think uh, mom and pop are going to be able, after they've redone all of their house and say have an accessory dwelling like we've been talking about that maybe would work, that's a lot of money. And uh, plus buying the, the inventory and all that stuff. So I think we have to balance it out. And, and I, I think this will be a technical issue that needs to be dealt with down the road. Thank you. Go ahead, Tracy. And on that point, Dwight, and this, this isn't the conversation to be deciding like how we're going to handle our infrastructure. I realize that, so I want to keep this really brief. But I was thinking the other day, like, what would I want to see on my own local road, just as an exercise? And I was thinking, do, do I actually want sidewalks installed? And I, and I, I felt I, I, can't, I felt like, no, I actually, I don't really, because what that would probably mean is that the sidewalks would encroach on um, people's property. We have, we have a ditch. We don't even have a flat space in front of our road, and then it's a very steep hill, so it wouldn't even work in front of our house without doing major um, re-engineering of the land. And then I thought, you know, what if there are more creative ways to deal with this? Like, could our road be 
closed off and be a pedestrian block? Probably not, actually. That probably wouldn't work for us. But could it be like a one-way street where we had one lane and then the ha half of it was taken over by pedestrians and bikes and planters? I don't know, maybe. Like I was just trying to think of like more creative way outside the box ways, like outside traditional sidewalk infrastructure that pedestrian and bike needs might be met on local roads that don't already have that infrastructure built in. So I just wanted to insert that into the conversation, even though I, we're not gonna solve that issue tonight. But I mean, I think we can think creatively about these things as we, <laughs> do I, we're gonna solve all of our problems tonight. <laughs> Um, I, I just like maybe we can think of um, creatively as we're envisioning what we want for a city like how it can look and maybe it doesn't have to look exactly how it's looked in the past or even what we think that it, it needs to look like. Well, I think you two guys have really solved a lot of our problems here if people would just listen to you. Um, I'll just jump in and say uh, if we overlaid uh, number five with the protection with technical issue uh, specs that you've talked about, Lori, and the community input, then I can become a lot more comfortable with, uh, uh, with expanding this to include, for instance, the, the neighborhood connections. Uh, I think you're right. You, you can't just say anywhere on either one of these streets you can do something like this. There's got to be, but you can't necessarily exclude it either. So it's how do you get out of this binary yes or no? I think you have to have that granularity and that'll come through the technical specs and, and particularly through the community input. I think that's a way to get around that. The other thing I don't wanna lose here either is just I think a number of people, Dwight and others have talked about, uh, in order, the infrastructure that would make uh, these sorts of businesses work uh, on, these, uh, on these busy streets uh, is very, as we said, is very expensive. And by saying we're gonna allow this, we're gonna have this happen in these specific areas, I think it does give the city the opportunity uh, to make those investments there. So that we have safe streets, streets that are accessible by bike and, and walking, uh, rather than uh, trying to spread it around the entire uh, uh, city. Over time, that may build in, uh, but I think a pragmatic approach here might be the most successful uh, in the short term, certainly, and in the long term, probably. So another infrastructure um, concern that I have as we're talking about adding more density to our community is not only our sidewalks or like pedestrian and bike friendly infrastructure, but I, I'm also very concerned about our stormwater infrastructure. So that's just something that I'd like to note as something I think we really need to be thinking about as we're envisioning this because stormwater is a huge environmental problem for us. And I, I think we can't, we can't think about um, adding more impervious services and more people without thinking about how we are going to manage our stormwater. That's not cheap either. Absolutely, Tracy. We should uh, solve all problems tonight. <laughs> we are going to solve all problems tonight. <laughs> um, so, Lori, uh, so yes. do you feel like you have a good sense on, on that you know, particular question and then sort of related, related ones? Okay, do you want to uh -huh. go, to, uh, go to another question while we're? Sure, I, I think that th there are a couple questions here that I, I view as pretty small questions. <laughs> you may disagree. Um, but if we go back to question number four, I think I already have heard the answer, but I would just like to confirm that, which is if we were to move to this more general opportunity with technical specifications and community input, would we also want to have separation requirements? Uh, we do that sometimes with businesses. And in this particular condition, um, the concern was that if we don't have separation requirements, then you actually could create a little district, which isn't the idea, really. Um, if we were going to create a little district, we probably would move to the format of identifying that district and letting businesses go there. So staff is recommending that there be some sort of a separation uh, requirement so that you don't end up with uh, five little businesses uh, right next to each other. Um, but you may have a different perspective. Would Anybody have a thought on that? Go ahead. Go ahead, Dennis. I tend to 
not want to do the separation unless it's well granulated, as you say, because uh, we don't know what size is going to go in. And there may be some synergy developed by having several next to each other. Um, so it's, it's hard for me at this point to say that that's what we want to decide at this point. Go ahead, Tracy. I think my initial response is perhaps similar to Dennis's and in, in wondering like, what would it be so bad if there was a coffee shop next to a grocery store, little, 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 like little neighborhood grocery store? Or would it be so bad if there were, <laughs> would it be so bad if there were a, a you know, a coffee store and then a bookstore? <clears throat> I don't, I don't know. Like I, can you maybe Lori think about what your, why? Yeah. why? I'll tell you what my concern was, okay. um, and I certainly see the benefit of that kind of a cluster. I totally get that, but at the point that you start having a cluster, you start inviting people in, and so the question was, is a little cluster that might attract those from outside the neighborhood, are, is the commission willing to accept that? Or is the interest at this point just really restricting it to service more the local neighborhood rather than creating um, mixed use districts in the neighborhood? Uh, Nathan and then Mike, go ahead. Uh, I mean, thinking back to what we've already discussed this evening, I think it kind of uh, falls along the lines answering your question, Lori, that we want to have local businesses, small businesses. We don't want a lot of traffic. Um, our point here is not to encourage people from outside of the local neighborhood to come in because that means that they're probably not wa walking or biking, which kind of defeats the purpose of all of this. Um, and so I guess it would be my point that, you know, maybe this, this, these spatial requirements are good and necessary to avoid that and just to promote smaller businesses to service the day-to-day -day needs of the local neighborhood. My fear would be that kind of like what you were saying, Lori, is that it would grow and cluster and uh, bring it in outside visitors, but not only outside visitors, but outside businesses as well, and then keep growing as a district. And then soon you have um, a section of a neighborhood that's purely business and retail, which I don't think is what we're hoping for or trying to promote. Um, and I, I see that opening up a lot of issues later on and um, encouraging encroachment of retail within the neighborhoods. And I don't think we want the encouragement or the encroachment of uh, retail districts within, within neighborhoods. If my, uh, my thought on this, it depends on what choices we're making here. If what we're talking about is having this development uh, centered on boulevards and maybe neighborhood connections, uh, then maybe we don't need the spacing as much. I mean, where we're at that point pretty much bending to the idea that they're gonna be developed as retail corridors uh, regardless. And so having the ability to be able to cluster those together in a way may be useful. Or, but if that's not what we're going to do, if we were going to open up uh, the single family neighborhoods uh, to this sort of allowable, then I think you definitely need to have spacing and a whole bunch of other requirements in there uh, to control that. Which kind of leads me to maybe we have two separate sets of criteria. Uh, maybe spacing and some other requirements are different depending upon whether you're being spaced with, whether you're being located within uh, one of these uh, retail corridors, uh, the busy, busier areas, uh, or internally within uh, a residential neighborhood. So in general, yes, spacing definitely, but I think depending upon what choices were made, uh, that could, you may have some nuance there that would need to be thought through a little more. Yeah. Uh, Dennis and Nathan. 
part of my reasoning for not thinking we needed to worry about the spacing as much is simply that we're going to have public comment and input and that may well by itself be sufficient to limit um, the size of whatever goes in. I suppose it might be more of a challenge uh, if a whole bunch of one's businesses want to do it at once, but I think then you're going to get a lot more neighbor opposition, neighborhood opposition. So I'm looking at that uh, public comment as being the control factor. That was my reasoning. Nathan, go ahead. Uh, another thought that occurred to me um, had to do with affordable housing. And when we start letting businesses and retail centers um, take away housing potential and housing space within our city, it reduces the amount of area that we have that may be used in the future for missile, missing middle housing or houses with ADUs and other opportunities to um, really address our affordable housing need within the city. Um, and you know, we, we have a finite amount of room within the city of Kenmore, um, and it's just trying to find that balance. And I think if we start opening retail districts or centers uh, within neighborhoods or within residential areas, that that can take away from the other needs that we should also be keeping in mind. Um, not not just the needs, but the, the square footage on the ground. Um, it, it's It's something that we can't really get back. And so we have to be careful with kind of how we open things up and what we want to prioritize. So I have a suggestion for this. Um, often in the comprehensive plan, when we're talking about uh, a goal, we flesh that out and we say, you know, here is the purpose of this. And this is where we would talk about, you know, it's to serve daily needs. And maybe we don't, we remain silent on, uh, the separation topic, but we make clear that we are not looking to greatly expand commercial districts, that this is to be a, um, a small neighborhood focus, uh, that kind of thing. So that when people are looking at, well, what's the point? What's the purpose? We clarify that it is in fact not to expand a, a commercial strip along a boulevard necessarily, but in fact to place these types of uses in a way that is servicing uh, the daily needs of the local neighborhood. And that might uh, help uh, clarify what is intended. I think that's a reasonable, yeah. I think that's a reasonable, reasonable um, approach. I can live with that. See a lot of heads nodding, so. Lori works her Lori, right. again. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Trying to get these thoughts down. Okay, so um, there are two questions left that uh, we had identified. And uh, we sort of answered number six, I think, which is uh, should corner stores be part of a mixed use development or is a small standalone commercial enterprise appropriate? I, I think I heard support for either option. Either it could be standalone or it could include residential. Is that, I'm seeing, <laughs> okay. Of a, of a small <laughs> I, neighborhood. I see scale. a head nod. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. And that brings us to the last question. And again, we're not um, uh, needing to answer this specifically, but it, it, it gets to, the, uh, to these technical specifications. Uh, that we might um, want to put something into the plan about, and that is should off-street parking be limited? I think uh, staff's perspective is, you know, again, we're hoping that people are walking and biking. Certainly there will be people who can't walk or bike and that 
would need to stop in a car. There would be deliveries if it were a grocery store, for example. But there needs to be recognition that there's not supposed to be a lot of parking provided to bring a lot of people into. It. By not providing parking, you can make it more difficult for it to become a more regional destination. So staff's recommendation is that there be a, a limit on the parking provided. Yeah, go ahead, Tracy. I am actually not opposed to people from other neighborhoods coming into my neighborhood and going to a bakery or whatever, a coffee shop. And in fact, I, like I have a friend who lives in near Arrowhead and she bikes up to my house. So I, I, like, I think actually if we had the, if we provide the right biking infrastructure, biking around Kenmore because it's so small in terms of its land area could actually be quite easy. And I, I think we should encourage that sort of thing actually. But that said, I am, I, I am in favor of, of limiting the amount of off street parking that is mandated because for environmental reasons, it provides more impervious surface which creates more stormwater runoff. Um, it does encourage driving. I feel like we need, I personally feel like we need to stop designing our neighborhoods for cars and start designing them for people. And I, I know right now we live in a reality where like I get in my car to do almost everything that doesn't involve like we can't actually walk to a park. But other than that, we have to get in the car mostly. Um, and I long for a day when that is not true. I long for a day when we can walk more places and where we have better public transit so that we could, you know, maybe instead of getting in a car, there's a streetcar that goes down 61st or whatever, you know, that there, there are more multimodal forms of transportation available to us. And I, I know it's hard to not design for the car because right now that's our reality, but I really feel like from an environmental point of view, from a climate point of view, I, I really feel like we need to start designing our communities for people and not for cars. So that's, that's why, I mean, my main reason for being in favor of having limits on the amount of um, off-street parking that we require. And not to mention that providing parking is, off-street parking is just expensive. It's an expensive use of our land. So I completely agree with what Tracy said. And to take it one step further, and I don't know how to, uh, Lori, you're going to have to help on this, but I think that if we can allow the city to specify on the on-street parking limitations, so like, um, uh, you know, what we don't want to happen is we restrict on-site parking, which is, I think, completely what we should be doing. And then what they do is they park all the, you know, up and down the street in front of other houses, which really uh, kind of pisses off the neighborhood, excuse my language, but that's what's going to happen. Uh, and then we're gonna get complaints about that. So I, I, I think if we could allow in certain circumstances that the um, city provide limitations to on-street parking for commercial purposes in such situations. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. I absolutely agree with Dwight. I think that would be great if we could figure out a way to do it. I, I, I think there should be a maximum parking allowance. I would suggest, uh, and I don't want to write the zoning here, but uh, I would suggest it be no greater than the current underlying zoning. Uh, so I think single family neighborhood, you can have two off street parking. I think that should be, uh, if you convert that to commercial use, it should be no greater than that. I got some comfort, Dwayne, out of uh, the off, the on street piece, thinking that this would be a major subject for that public input. It was one of the reasons why I really think that's important and why, and why I want to have that in there before I would support any of the rest of these. If the community gets to hear, okay, I'm going to open business X and I'm going to be seeing 50 people a day walking through my, and oh yeah, uh, maybe only 20% of them, that's 10, uh, are going to be driving in maybe, but that's a discussion and that's a criteria that could be built into the, uh, into the discussion and also in the design requirements. To specify what they think 
what that's going to be. So the community has a heads up. I'm, I'm, I'm personally am flexible, and I think Mike, you 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 state that well, and and I, I don't want to be one to say it has to be a certain we got to do it, but if we can write the intent yes. well, and and Lori's really good at doing this, I think that I think it can be done, and and we can move maybe move on. Yeah, go ahead, Nathan. I agree with uh, both of you guys and what you guys had to say. I, I agree that we should um, really limit um, the, the parking in this kind of way. Um, I think that would help make this more of a community, um, a locally neighborhood uh, retail or whatever service it provides. Um, and it really focuses it to just being that. And I think that was kind of our goal with this and what we were pushing for. And I think that helps encourage that. Um, the only one little add on I'd say is, uh, I know we're not writing zones and I'm not trying to step on Commissioner Van Allen's toes here. Um, I, I somewhat agree with the underlying um, zoning in regards to parking regulations. But also, I also want to be cognizant of what you said, Lori, about like uh, ADA accessible spots and also um, load and unload zones. Um, so I agree that maybe keeping that, but in addition, maybe adding a couple more spots for ADA accessible spots and maybe a load and unload spot or, so, or something like that. But trying to limit it as much as feasibly possible. Yeah, well said. I, I agree with Nathan on that, on that addendum. <laughs> Those are all my questions. <laughs> Great. Great information. So um, the next step will be for us to craft uh, a goal and some policies that tackle this issue. And um, the good news is that we'll be working on that and you've provided just a wealth of uh, policy direction. Uh, the bad news is that we're probably not gonna be taking it up until later in the year. So we just finished our review of a whole bunch of commercial issues. And now we're gonna switch gears in August. Uh, we, the survey is closed. So for your next agenda, you're gonna get, it's called a top line summary of survey results. And uh, so you'll see that. And then at the second meeting in August, we'll look at the public participation plan and use the survey to help us craft that. Um, we'll also take up the vision statement uh, in August, and then starting in the fall, we'll turn our attention to missing middle housing and try to set some policy direction on the residential side. So that's what's coming up. That's what's in store. Great. Sounds interesting. And so anything more uh, for us tonight, Lori, for, for you or from Debbie? I don't know if she's still with us, but... <laughs> I'm sure she's still with us, just with us at the meeting here. <laughs> she's there. I can see her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything. Great. Okay. Uh, anything else from our colleagues that want to share before we uh, adjourn? Congratulations to Nathan on his award from the Heritage Society. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And a special thank you to the Heritage Society and Suzanne for putting that all on. It was really a surprise. I'm deeply, deeply honored. It, you know. Well, you know, well deserved, yeah. Nathan. Well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, so ahead, right? some of us might be a little new to this. So a uh, topic that seems to have come up a couple times is this consent agreement and what and how that all affects Lake Point. I honestly do not really know this and don't understand it. So I was wondering if st staff could point me or us to something where we could more understand how this whole thing works and what when people are talking about it, what is reality and what is not. 
Um, I would say that the consent decree as it relates to Lake Point is not a policy discussion that the Planning Commission would be having. Planning Commission's focus for Lake Point is on the comprehensive plan policies, which we reviewed with you a couple of weeks ago. And probably later in the year would be the P suffix conditions, the, the cleanup of those. Uh, the consent decree would come into play if and when there is a specific um, development proposal. Uh, and that would then be reviewed through the permitting process, which would not be part of the Planning Commission's work program. I just don't even know what it is. So I'm just, if, I, I just need some information. So when people use this term, I'm educated and I'm not, um, Right. that's I, all I'm asking. I'm not asking it sure. to be put on the agenda. I just would like to be educated from the city's perspective. I would say the consent decree um, is an agreement between the Department of Ecology and the property owner for cleanup of the site. And there are certain requirements that need to occur at the time of property development. And there are certain requirements regarding monitoring. And that's sort of been in a, in a nutshell without going into too much detail. Okay, thank you. And this, the specific consent degree for that property was provided to us in the email sent to us by um, a resident, Elizabeth Mooney. Well, I just- You I, can- yeah. understand that I just wanted to make sure that what I'm getting from outside is what the city's perspective of what I should be reading so I'm not reading something that's not the whole story I I like whole stories that's all yeah well the dissent the the consent degree like Debbie said comes from the Department of Ecology so it's an official document it is, but I would, again, I would sort of, sort of reiterate that this would not be part of the Planning Commission's discussion related to the comprehensive plan policies. Okay. All right, anything else for tonight uh, from anybody? All right, thank you, everybody. We're adjourned, and we'll uh, see you in August. Have a good rest of the month. Good night, all. Thank you. Good night.